Hello everybody, how is you? So, first things first, right? We got the lovely sirs here with me, of course. I have Domino's I'm eating. Parmesan bites, which are probably gonna fuck up my stomach. One more like my gallbladder, because it's very white Italian bread. Mm. I also got myself a Brooklyn style pizza. It has way more spinach than what I thought. But I'm really happy there's more spinach. Ooh. I'm sorry, I'm just sitting here like, ooh, they gave me a coupon. Which is like, that's nice. I might use that later. I don't know if I'm going to eat that pizza now. I got bites. But anyway, yeah. So, also, this is my robes in the house. Just so you know. This is how I um, stay warm as winter is coming. Because my house regularly stays cold. Which is a good thing, honestly. I prefer a cold. I'd rather bundle up. About the same time, it's kind of like, mmm... I don't want it ending up being cold enough to shatter a window. You know what I'm saying? So I have to do something about that. Anyway, I know many of you have heard me say many times, human DNA is junk DNA. And it really is. And this also goes with the fractal video I presented the other day and this dude is interesting I don't even know how this came about he just popped up he made this video what? 10 months ago which is like Mandela which is almost like oh like Mandela Ooh, interesting but yeah his video is called you've been lied to about genetics his channel is sub anima go check him out please give him a like and we will continue so, we've been lied to about genetics. Think of it as making constants into variables and then be surprised it works. Between 1990 and 2003, the Human Genome Project sequenced our entire genetic code, or as they like to call it, the human blueprint. During the mid-90s, the hopes for the project were high. Mm -hmm. Science journalist Laurie Garrett imagined that by 2020, everyone would be carrying around their own little genome cards. So, if you ever ended up in hospital, doctors would be able to swipe your card to see which mutation was causing the problem, and you'd then be sent off for gene therapy to be cured. Easy peasy. That was the promise of the Human Genome mm -hmm. Project. But 2020 was now three years ago, and no one's carrying around a genome card. The harsh reality for the project was that the link between our DNA and who we are is way more complicated than we imagined. For the You know what that whole like genome card thing kind of reminds me of? It actually kind of reminds me of um, what people would say about the, the 666 or the marking of the beast or whatever it was. When I was growing up in the church, they would repeatedly make it sound like, oh, well, that little chip thing they're going to put in the card, that's the mark of the beast. Oh, they're going to put a little barcode in your wrist, and, and it's the mark of the beast. When you squint your eyes, you can see the mark of the beast that I do, and it helps you stay that. I, like, I don't know. It was Everything was the mark of the beast. Like, Pokemon was of the devil. Harry Potter taught kids witchcraft, which, yeah, strangely enough, it did, but only around, like, the late 2020s. Which we haven't gotten to the late 2020s. Well, maybe the last few years. But yeah, like that, that's also weird. Because it's like Buffy has been here this entire time. But whatever. I'm just old school and shit, right? So it, it, like, it's kind of interesting to see and get reminded of a time. When like people were all hyped up about the future. Like, well, people used to be about flying cars. And then it's 2023. And everyone's still mad about gas prices. There ain't a car flying. There were airplanes, but the motherfucker. Those are just buses that fly. You have to fly with everybody else. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it, it was just a, like, it was like, oh my God, that's such a refreshing memory. And then I realized I am that generation now. Kids don't even know what that receiver, like, receiver symbol on their phone is. 
or why it's called dial-up, you know? But let's continue. The majority of characteristics that make you, you, there just isn't a direct connection between gene and trait. That seems to go against what we get taught at school and what we see in the media, where it seems as though there's genes for blue eyes, genes for red hair, genes for Scottishness. My DNA comes from Scotland and Ireland. Genes for sexuality, even genes for dog ownership. It's all encoded in the programming language of life. So what's wrong with this picture? The father of genetics was Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian friar who also had a keen interest in science. Although he initially wanted to become a teacher, his highly relatable fear of oral presentations caused him to fail the certification Aww. exam twice. With a Poor teaching dude. career seemingly out of grasp, he decided to go about, about conducting his right. own research in happened. the monastery garden in Brno. Oh. Between 1856 and 1863, Mendel used over 28,000 pea plants to study plant hybridization, and his results are familiar to anyone who's studied high school genetics today. He found that the hybridization of different coloured peas, as well as other traits, followed regular patterns. For instance, if a yellow pea plant was crossed to a green pea plant, all the offspring would be yellow. You might remember this from school as yellow being a dominant trait and green being a recessive one. Do this dude took a hundred and some odd fucking peas. Certain ones changed the color of the other. You say they were from a different mother. But collectively, they were all the same. Together. Okay, I'm done being extra. I'm done being extra. Mm -hmm. Spring of these hybrid yellow plants, when crossed to each other, would then have a three to one ratio of yellow peas to green ones. This is the origin of the infamous concept of skipping a generation. Mm -hmm. Green was present in the first generation, disappeared in the second, only to reappear in the third. Another common example of this kind of inheritance is eye colour. Much like Mendel's peas, brown eyes are dominant to blue ones, and using special tables known as Punnett squares, we can quickly find out that it's possible for two brown-eyed parents to have a blue-eyed child because they happen to carry hidden or recessive blue genes, but it's impossible for two blue-eyed parents to have a brown-eyed child. Okay, so we understand at this point that it's more along the lines of, um, kind of the game of slots when it comes to genetics, right? Not that it actually is a, um, set up a system a design itself as much as it is an amalgamation almost an idea of the second rule slash theory of whatever thermodynamics is it that one it's the atrophy where there is all this knowledge in these genetics and yet the simplest ones like, assume you're asking the question to the randomness, and, it, and it'll toss everything at you. And then nothing at you, and then it comes up with the, that one result. It's like, here's all the answers. This is the one I decided to come up with, just randomly. Not even a good reason. And it's the same way with, well, apparently genetics. It's like, it doesn't matter what it is. If your grandmother fucked somebody who was black four generations ago, there's a good chance someone's kid's gonna end up black. Doesn't matter how soon. A lot of people are confused. Their kid turned out whiter than them with like the cutest red curls. And it's just like, what, like, but this is how genetics for the most part work. Um, jumblation, yes, but in truth, when you really look at, thank you, from when you really look at this, there is no set order for, um, what will be dominant it will dominate if it wants to dominate and we have all of these choices all ending up the same but when you looked at the brown uh let's see you get the fuck out the way thank you i'm so glad that that still moves because like muscle is such a different beast <clears throat> now as you can see with the brown eyes instead of the blue one this recessive of gene is here in the both of them right but do any of the colors of brown look any different from each other? Now we can see there's one right here, which is the ultra brown. There are these two browns that have a slightly differences, but they're definitely the same, although in different positions, right? This one still gets has to be a little bee from here, not from here, but that doesn't matter because there's a big bee taking over all of that. But then we got the two tiny bees over here, which makes the one different, the one that's very noticeably 
the fuck he differs. It's just like, why are you fucking blue? Who do you belong to? You know, and, and, and like that's and that's the point. It does. It, it, it's random. It, it, it like only good stuff comes out every once in a while with the junk is being tried to set here or recessive blue genes, but it's impossible for two blue-eyed parents to have a brown-eyed child. Altogether, Mendel's picture of inheritance, as it was interpreted by his followers, gave the following picture of genetics. 1. Genes are tightly linked to traits and act like blueprints. If you find a specific gene in your genetic blueprint, you know exactly what trait will occur. 2. Inheritance can be easily tracked using Mendel's laws of inheritance, giving us phenomena like the famous 3 to 1 ratio. 3. The impact of the environment is minimal. Traits can be determined using Punnett squares in any environmental context. Yeah, did you hear that? Impact of the... Blueprint genetics, genes for traits, laws of inheritance, ignore environment. Environment is minimal. Traits can be determined using Punnett squares in any environmental context. But none of those things are actually true, not even for a seemingly simple trait like eye colour. For one, eyes can come in all shades of blue, brown, grey, multicoloured, two different colours, and can even change throughout your lifetime with some babies being born with blue eyes and going on to develop brown eyes. Mm -hmm. Discrete categories like blue and brown are actually decided pretty arbitrarily by ignoring all other variation. In reality, eye colour is the product of many genes acting together, not a single gene with two forms that can be modelled with a Punnett square. As a result, it's entirely possible for blue-eyed parents to have brown-eyed children. Mm -hmm. This fact is not really surprising to geneticists and has right. been well known for over a hundred years, because there's too much of a chance for, like, the blue-eyed parents to have parents that might have had brown eyes, or their parents have brown eyes. What's really not the understanding portion is, is it doesn't matter who you mate with, what comes out is what is the dominant. Like, you get what you get. Quit sitting here wondering why you got it like this. You got it, didn't you? What I understand is, is, like, no matter who you're with, or how wonderful your relationship is, there is a hundred percent chance you can have an ugly baby. I just, I just want everybody to realize that there's a hundred percent chance you can have an ugly child. I mean, they can be beautiful when you first get them, and then they'll start looking, I don't know, like a fucking caveman, ugly as fuck, unibrow, uh, like weird spaces in their teeth. It's just like, how did the fuck did this? I don't. You're not my baby, or something like that. Just. Mm. It's like, you know, there's a good chance you can have an ugly baby. Always remember that. It's low, but it's never fucking zero. <laughs> it doesn't fail to freak parents out. But if Mendel's story doesn't even work for eye colour, then what is the right way to think about how genes work in humans and other organisms? In 1957, Conrad Hall Waddington published The Strategy of the Genes, whose key argument can be summarised in these two figures. Waddington suggests that we should think of genes not in terms of blueprints or Punnett squares, but as a complex system of pegs and guy ropes that hold up a surface like a circus tent. The traits that we develop, like blue or brown eyes, are then the result of a marble rolling down this complicated landscape into one of the valleys. As Waddington himself admits, following this three-dimensional metaphor is tricky, so to make things clearer, I've simplified his argument down to something familiar. Here I've built a mm -hmm. Steve Mould style 2D version of the Waddington landscape, and it ends up looking like the classic Marble Drop Carnival game, where you place a marble at the top and try to aim it into the highest score at the bottom. In this modified version of Waddington's metaphor, genes are the paddles there. in the middle, and the bins at the bottom are different traits, like different possible eye colours. The ball falling then represents the process of development, from single-celled embryo to adult. As for the environment, Waddington oh was a little inconsistent in conceptualising its role, but at least in one instance, another figure in the strategy of the genes, he uses an arrow to show an environmental stimulus bumping the marble in a particular direction. That'll do for us, and we can simulate it with a push from this hairdryer.
Ooh, wind speed. Mm -hmm. Waddington's landscape gives us quite a few useful insights that are missed by the Mendelian picture. First and foremost, we can clearly see that every trait has to be the product of many genes working together mm -hmm. to funnel the marble down a particular path. You can imagine how complex this marble run would have to be to determine things like cardiovascular disease, for instance, as illustrated beautifully by this figure from the Genetics Pedagogies Project. More on them later. Or take the Y chromosome that's often considered to determine the male sex. XY chromosomes in your genetic blueprint give a male person, and XX chromosomes give a female. We can visualise this on Waddington's landscape with this red paddle being the Y chromosome. When it's there, the marble always goes into the male bin, and when it's not there, the marble always goes into the female mm. bin. But from cases like South African runner Casta Semenya, a woman with XY chromosome... So the only difference between like the X chromosome and the Y chromosome is still a phallus-shaped stick. Good game. Good game. We already know that this picture is too simple. This is because the Y chromosome has to function in concert with many other genes to collectively determine sex. But if these other genes were altered in some way, or if different amounts of hormones are present through development, mm -hmm. the landscape could shift in complex ways to get different sexual patterning. So the Y chromosome is hardly the only important factor in determining sex. Even without changing the landscape, randomness can also arise naturally by the marble happening to fall into a different bin by pure chance. Mm. This is partly what happens when identical twins, who have the same genetics, end up with different handedness, different eye colours, different neurological conditions like schizophrenia, even different sexes. Of course, differing environments also play a role in generating variation between identical twins too. But either way, we can now see why it's misleading to call the Y chromosome, or specifically SRY, the gene for maleness. It can certainly make a big difference in how genetic characteristics are determined, but it can't act alone and it doesn't guarantee anything. Really, we shouldn't talk about genes for anything, because the structure of all traits looks similar to sex. They're the product of complex networks of genes acting together with the environment. Even traits that are supposedly under the control of a single gene, like cystic fibrosis, PKU, and Huntington's disease, can be modified in their severity by several other genes and mm -hmm. environmental factors, again highlighting the convoluted relationship between gene and trait. It's a well, Think about it this way, right? I'm eating this pizza on a... Well, it's a Brooklyn-style pizza. But it's with gluten-free bread because it's easier on my gallbladder right if i were to eat this pizza on some regular well it's probably gonna get fucked up because of the, the parmesan bites but i'll be alright. but imagine me eating this whole pizza which in my younger years i let's fuck oh I, I i could slam three pizzas by myself back in the day let me tell you what i i was a champ at like eating and shit but that's beside the point now let's say i eat this pizza and i have this issue with my gallbladder or whatever right um, genetic, with the genetics that, like, are running in me right now, I already have this propensity, thank you, for things to flare up, my gallbladder being an issue, I get gassy, but I can't get rid of the gas, which is the worst feeling ever, like, you don't realize what babies go through and, until that happens, you know, like, you don't realize how much you love a burp, but, I should have made that, no, I didn't, but, um, if I were to eat a whole pizza, that was not gluten free. With my genetic coding, basically, and the traits, being like, hey, interact poorly if she eats some white fucking bread. Right. I go on to eat that white bread, and it'll affect me poorly. However, what could also happen is the genes inside of me could be triggered to start acting a certain type of way. Maybe not in a way that's going to hurt me or help me, but just some adverse effect. Like, ah, let's develop gout. Let, let, let's just develop gout because I feel look, we don't know what's going on over here I feel like panicking let's just develop gout things could happen in the body to just kickstart one thing you know there could be something in your genetic line where it's like one thing will trigger something and then just a slew of other shit goes on the way not because that's some like destiny or maybe like some generational curse or whatever but because that's how the genes interact with each other one acting and in one way can also affect many other things. Um, you need a lot of conditionals and uh, different variables in order to get 
the genes to act and behave in certain man manners and mannerisms. Which is why I'm totally convinced if you can fuck with someone's genes, you can find a way of poison them without anybody knowing it. I'm just putting that out there. You're welcome. Bye. It's annoying that Ooh, Mendelian genetics follow such up. nice rules, and it would seem as though Waddington's landscape lacks the mathematical niceties of genotype ratios and Punnett squares. But in the past few years, this has begun to change, with the landscape moving from being a mere metaphor to inspiring mathematically rigorous models that describe Man. real developmental patterns. This has also been helped along by the development of new technologies, particularly those that allow us to study the gene expression of individual cells. For instance, James DeFrisco and Yogi Yeager have shown that the exact same genes in the exact same network of interactions can actually result in significantly different morphological patterns in flies. The reason behind this is a little hard to show on my 2D marble run diagram, but in Waddington's original figure, this is because the genes, the pegs, can pull with different tensions on the guy ropes to affect the landscape, where the tensions in the ropes represent the strengths, timings, and rates of interaction in the gap gene network. The result of all this pulling of guy ropes are qualitative changes in the genetic landscape. For instance, it's possible for a bistable regime, where the marble can only roll down into two valleys, to turn into a multi-stable one, where more valleys open up for the marble to roll into. This opens up the possibility for new traits to emerge in the population. And visually, we can imagine how loosening the slack in this imaginary guy rope could turn the landscape on the left into the one on the right. Mm -hmm. All of this does leave one big historical question it's unturned. All this subtle how did Mendel changes. end up with such nice results despite all of this complexity. Well, the truth is that Mendel's peas were actually pretty special. When other biologists tried to replicate Mendel's results, like Raphael Weldon tried to do in 1902, their peas looked nothing at all like mm. Mendel's. Weldon found that pea colour actually existed on a spectrum, from yellow to green. It definitely didn't seem like a binary trait like we see in today's textbooks or Mendel's original paper. Weldon wrote in a letter to statistician Carl Pearson sus. that Mendel must either be a truly astonishing man or a black liar. But Why is he this a black has been liar? a little harsh on Mendel because remember, he was only directly interested in plant hybridization, not heredity itself. And to study hybrids, he first had to purify his pea plants to remove any intermediate variation. This wasn't easy and took him two years of artificial breeding to get purebred lines that mm. maintain their colour across generations. Unknowingly, Mendel was essentially fudging the Waddington landscape of the pea colour genes to the very boring case of a marble going into the same bin every time. And once he'd done that, the patterns we retrospectively call Mendel's Laws of Inheritance do indeed emerge, but only in this very particular context. To quote Annie Jameson and Greg Raddick, These patterns do arise, but they arise only under special conditions, notably when humans, like Mendel, have engineered mm -hmm. artificially purified lineages into being by deliberately excluding unwanted variability. It Same as like breeding dogs, ain't it? These things arrive, and yet only through human intervention do things that are unwanted get excluded. But do they really get excluded? Or are they just removed for a time before something comes in to activate the genes to revamp something all over again? Like, sure, you removed it or whatever, removed it or whatever, but you just made it more likely not to show up. Eventually, that's just going to build up over time to at some point become dominant enough to be a challenger to the next dominant gene, even if it is recessive, right? Therefore, a pretty big mistake. You could even call it a misinterpretation of Mendel's experiments to extend his results to the entire biological world in the wild. I can hear some of you saying, Jake, this is the second video you've done critiquing models in biology that have been hugely successful. Yes, okay, they have their flaws, but aren't we supposed to teach students the oversimplified model first? And to that, I'll respond with a resounding no. This line of thinking is based on the idea that students are these silly little naive souls that are only ready for the truth once they're grown up. Truth is, students are extremely receptive to being taught a more accurate and modern genetics curriculum. The genetic You know, fun story, right? I was like three, four years old. This is me and my brother. My little sister wasn't born yet. Christmas Day. 
I was super duper excited to see what I got. I got one of those um, ballerina dolls that dance with little like um, music key in the back, or uh, I can't remember. What, it's like a turnable thing where you turn it, like a wind up box or some shit. Wind up toy, I think it's called. And but I didn't know I was getting it yet. And <clears throat> I went to go get it. The monster. <sighs> Fine. I'm using this as extra in my cold ass house, but somebody don't want me having it on because he don't like the smell of it. But it's like nigga, it's cold. But whatever. But um, and then at some point, me and my brother we ran into the living room, being like, "Yay, Santa brought us presents!" And my father, because my mother was not home at that time. Looked at me and my brother. He's just like, what are you talking about? Santa? There's no such thing as Santa. I bought you this. Me and your mom bought you this. You're never too young to know the truth. But there are ways of being a, a little inappropriate with it. But you're never too young to know the truth. I'll let you know that right now. This pedagogy's project did just that. They created an introductory genetics course that placed the entangled nature of genes, environments, and organisms front and center, and contextualized Mendelian traits as a rare, special case. And compared to students who took the more traditional course, the 28 students taught the new curriculum emerged as less believing of genetic determinism and better prepared to understand the subtleties of modern genetics. Surely the point of a good scientific education should be to do just that, to teach students modern science, not dwell in outdated paradigms. Any okay, so do you guys understand that the way I mentioned zodiacs now? Because almost everything works in the same fucking model we can think about. Same way with the zodiac signs. Everyone wants to think that the rising sign is the most important aspect of your natal chart. It is just like, no, it's your sun sign. Like, just because I'm a Sagittarius rising doesn't mean shit if the model of my car is Capricorn. It's just that Sagittarius rising is the key, and my moon, which is the Aquarius, is the engine. You know, there's a whole difference. And then there are little elements, like the AC was built by Gemini Co. and Co., uh, I'm having trouble with the pistons, but that's because it was made by a Leo. Hidden fees, that's fucking Scorpio. That's fucking Scorpio. Insurance. Libra. Mm. When you think about it that way, it kind of makes more sense with understanding the zodiacs a little better. Uh, so people might sit there and look at you and be like, oh, well, they're going by... Da -da -da -da. It's not, like they don't understand what they're talking about. They're not that skilled. But if you look at it in a way as in like, no, this is a component of the whole. Uh, I still need to mention it. But the whole is this aspect, this sign, this right here. And this is how it is developed. It's, it takes on a whole different meaning in that measure. One that can understand how a marble run works is capable of understanding how our genetics actually work. There's no need to lie. Plus, even if we eventually teach students the modern picture of genetics in later courses, there's a very good chance that students difference. never get mm -hmm. exposed to these subtleties because they never end up taking the more advanced courses. I'm sure the vast majority of you only got exposed to the Mendel's P style of genetics at school, and that was it. With the Mendelian blueprint picture firmly ingrained in the minds of most students, the public at large is much more prone to believe questionable headlines like genes determine how young use internet and social media, and scientists find 24 golden genes that help you get rich. Like... If instead we place better metaphors, like Waddington's landscape, in the curriculum from the beginning, these headlines would be quickly dismissed as nonsense. Hopefully most of you realize that there's something dodgy going on with the claim that something as complex as income could be determined by a genetics. Not to mention how deterministic thinking like this can easily move across into talk of good genes and bad genes, mm -hmm. and then blaming the poor for being poor because of some innate genetic characteristic, right. and we've mindlessly just slid into eugenics territory. And that's the fun part. Eventually, it always dwells down to like, hmm... Like it always goes down this way. All every time human beings get involved with something, something gets fucked up. Nothing happened with any other animal. Oh, what about a beaver? They're chewing trees. They're only chewing so many trees, so they have a fucking house. 
that's it. Well, what about all these cows shitting and farting all in the air and like ruining with methane and shit? Well, we like who's the, who? Why are there cows? Why are there so many cows? You know, it, it's just, like like communism was another, communism was fine until humans got a hold of that shit and decided the ideology was too eloquent to come from a black man with that kind of hair. I'm I'm going with that conspiracy theory. I totally think Karl Marx is a black dude. It makes so much sense to me why they hate it so much. It makes so much sense. That's beside the point. I just want to say that to be contrarian and to have someone. Tr <laughs> Someone's gonna be so upset. Be like, how do you say? I I I just for that reaction, baby. Just for that reaction. But this goes along with the uh, fractal shit. So. We already know how codes are made up, but now we understand why it's so difficult to read through these codes, right? So, if you haven't seen the fractal one yet, go to that and you'll understand. Thank you, phone. Why this shit's weirder than what we all... Like, life is, it gets so much more weirder the older you get. But the more you learn... Uh, I, you know what? It doesn't matter what you learn it doesn't matter how much you learn you're still gonna be confused as fuck i'm i'm lying you're still gonna be confused as fuck all right uh, talk to you later bye